Thanks for joining me for chapter six today. Let's see what happens to Esker and Flint next. Flint woke to the sunlight streaming through the cracks in the moss and the timber. Normally he would have welcomed the dawn after so many months of darkness, but now it felt like a warning. They didn't have long to halt the Ice Queen's quest for immortality. He swung out of bed and glanced at Esker. She was still asleep. And to Flint's surprise and irritation, he saw that Pebble was curled up in a ball at the bottom of her bed. Not his. She's even bothersome in her sleep, Flint thought to himself, scooping the fox pup into his arms and tiptoeing out of the hut. The dogs yapped from out of the outhouse, and only when Flint pulled back the mound of stones he placed over his catch and tossed them, a fish to share did they hush. The dwarf willows either side of the river were cloaked in white, but the sky above was a brilliant blue, and as Flint listened, he could hear the soft flump of snow sliding off branches at the pop and the crack of the river ice melting. Spring was in full swing, and Flint knew that the river was not to be trusted as a way across the driftlands when the temperatures began to climb. He gathered up an armful of branches, tried his best not to think about what Tomkin might say if he declared, when home, that he was a warrior who believed in magic, and laid them out of sight behind the hut. Before long he had a fire going, and with his anything knife he pierced the chunks of the second salmon he had caught and held them up at the flames to cook. Eskus shuffled through the snow towards him. You should have woken me, she whispered. I would have... Got in the way, Flint said. Helped with the fire, Flint shrugged, quicker on my own. He held out a scoop of bark laden with fish, and Esker shoveled mouthful after mouthful down. Flint raised an eyebrow. You'd think you hadn't eaten in a year. I haven't, Esker replied, not since the ice cream locked me up in the music box. It wasn't food or water that kept me alive, just a dark magic. Flint wanted to ask more. Despite what he might have said, magic in all its forms fascinated him. But he was still cross and suspicious of Esker, so he caught himself just before the words slipped out and threw her a death stare instead. Esker was too busy enjoying to eating to notice. Last night, I watched you cut a hole in the river ice, then plunge your spear in, she said between bites. Then it looked like you were muttering something, but from inside the hut I couldn't hear anything. What were you saying? Flint looked up. You were watching me. I thought you were asleep. Esker shook her head. I figured watching and listening was probably the best way to learn about hunting. She paused. I don't imagine I'd be a particularly good hunter. I've not had much experience jamming spears into things, but hopefully I'll pick it up after a while. Her eyes brightened, like I did with the break on the sled. Flint squinted. The only reason the sled hadn't careered off was because he had stamped his boot over Esker's. There was no way she'd have the strength to hold it on her own. He looked at her gaunt face, her straggled hair and the furs that almost swallowed her body. Nothing about this girl was geared up for the wild, and before he could stop himself, he found he was offering her advice. There are rituals attached to hunting, and the tribes always honour them, he said. First you thank the North Star, the Sky God who breathed life into Erkenwald. He stopped suddenly, catching himself. No one thanked the Sky Gods anymore, but he did, because despite what he had told Esker earlier, he still believed in the gods. How could he not, when he could feel their magic hovering over the kingdom? Flint cleared his throat. <clears> throat> He hadn't known the girl long, but it seemed to be annoyingly difficult to steer conversations in the direction he wanted with Esker. Her voice had a habit of drawing surprise and often unfortunate things out of him. He decided to move on quickly. Then you thank the animal itself for giving up its life for you. An animal chooses its own death, you see. It chooses the hunter to whom it will submit. And he ran a hand down Pebble's back. There's a bond between animals and tribes out here. <sighs> Esker breathed a sigh of relief. That's good to know, because if the bond between the tribes were all broken, you'll probably want the animals to hold things together. Flint narrowed his eyes at Esker. There was a mad sort of logic to her, and he wasn't sure whether he liked it. Before he could reply, Pebble slipped from his side, poked his nose under Esker's elbow, and gobbled up the last of her fish. Flint smirked as Pebble waddled back to him and crawled into his lap. You've got to watch your food when Pebble's around. Flint threw a handful of snow on the fire and fizzled out. His appetite is out of control. Esker followed Flint back towards the hut. How did you and Pebble meet? She asked Harring to keep up. Was it on the hunt and Pebble refused to choose his own death? Maybe he felt he had more eating to do before he submitted to a hunter. There was a snuffle grunt from the ball of white fur tucked inside Flint's hood. It sounded quite like a chuckle. Found him in our camp, scavenging food, Flint replied, but he made sure he didn't meet Esker's eyes because this wasn't what had happened at all. Shortly after, they were back on the sled, racing between the dwarf willows and the drifts of snow as they travelled further and further south. Flint shivered as the first notes of the Ice Queen's anthem floated over the land. The choir was ever so slightly louder with each day that passed, and Flint grimaced now he knew why. 
Had the ice queen already stolen his ma's voice, would he ever be able to get it back for her? Flint focused on his sled to stop his thoughts spiralling, keeping the river to his right and watching as Esker's eyes travelled beyond that to the mighty never cliffs in the distance, a sprawl of jagged peaks locked in the harsh white litter of snow. Now and then she gasped and pointed at things, and mostly Flint ignored her, but when her gaze shifted to the trees a few miles ahead, he knew the conversation was inevitable. The trees were not small and struggling like the willow shows beyond them. They were tall and bold, the type of tree you could start climbing at sunrise and only reach the top of when the first stars showed. And as Flint saw them, a smile spread across his face. Deep roots, he said. The start of it, anyway. There are spruce trees here, older than the Erkenwald's glaciers, with roots that stretch so far into the earth they reach depth even the whales in the oceans know nothing about. Esker gulped. So, where exactly will you take me after I've spoken to your brother? For a second, Flint felt a stab of regret that he planned to leave Esker in the forest. It would be fun showing someone other than his little sister his secret laboratory up in the trees and all the inventions stored in there. But then he remembered his failed rescue mission and the danger and the details that he had banished the thought from his head. I haven't decided yet, he said stiffly. He steered in his sled between the willows, which had grown denser and taller now the forest was in sight, and without warning the dogs swerved and backed up in their tracks. The sled stopped and Flint peered ahead. What is it? Esker whispered. Flint secured the brake and stepped off the runners, clutching his anything knife in his shaking hand, and he crept over to the snow until he was level with the dogs. There was a scuffling sound from behind a willow and a high-pitched cry that made Esker jump. Flint edged forward and there, huddled under the branches of the tree, was a very large bird. He slipped his knife back into its sheath. A golden eagle, said to Esker, and she tiptoed closer. Female, it looks like. They grow much bigger than the males, and this one's huge. He nodded to the wire encircling the bird's talon. It was attached to a chain that had been tied around the trunk of the willow, and it's got itself trapped in a fox snare. The bird flung its body back from the snare, then flapped its wings against the snow. They were fast and flecked with brown, black and gold feathers. But the snare didn't loosen, and after another failed tassel, the eagle jabbed at the wire with its hooked beak. We have to help it, Esker whistled. Flint looked up at Deep Roots. Tomkin would have noticed he was gone by now. He'd be worried, and so would his sister, Blue. Even if we do free the eagle, it won't survive. Its talons probably crushed, and it will need to hunt. Flint tugged at her sleeve. Let's go. But Esker stayed where she was, crouched opposite the eagle, and her girl and the bird stared at each other for several seconds. Flint had seen eagles before, but never this close. Its eyes seemed to burn like the desert sand, and there was something in the way it looked at Esker, as if it was seeing things that perhaps he had missed. Shaking himself, Flint turned away, but a few seconds later the eagle began to hiss and flap. Flint twirled around to see Esker bent over the snare, her mittens laid down on the snow beside her. The eagle's wings thrashed against her back, nearly knocking her over, but she didn't back away. She kept close to the bird, her fingers working at the trap, and for a moment Flint thought how natural Esker looked alongside the eagle. Wild animals were hard to approach, even harder to help, but Esker was right there beside this bird, as if possible. She had tended to wild animals before. He strode towards her. What are you doing? Those wings could break your arm. The eagle yanked back, shrieking, but Esker had managed to loosen the loop of wire a little, and in a flurry of snow and feathers, the eagle burst free, tumbling over itself before stilling a few metres from Esker. Go on now, she panted. You're free. The eagle blinked as Esker, its golden head cocked to one side, then it limped behind another tree, trailing its tail and feathers out of sight. Esker stood up and looked at Flint. Like you said, there's a bond between animals and people out here. Flint said nothing for a moment, and then he dragged Esker back to the sled. Get on, we can't afford any more detours. But although Flint kept his eyes trained on the trees ahead as they raced towards deep roots, he was sharply aware of two things. Esker had shown she had more knowledge of the wild than she realised, and the eagle she had freed was still watching them from the back among the willows. So do we know any more about Esker now? Does she know any more about herself and her past? See what we find out tomorrow in chapter 7.